Chapter thirty two of the Apostle of Alaska The Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Serpent. In the meantime, there was quite a turmoil in the offices of the Church Missionary Society. Upon receipt of Mr. Duncan's long letter, he was informed that his explanations were satisfactory and that he need not come to England a letter was dispatched post haste to the bishop instructing him not to deliver the enclosure but too late the enclosure had burned the bishop's hands till he had a chance to prematurely deliver it and now came the news that the indians were unanimously duncan's indians and not the society's not even one single solitary soul was there to whose spiritual wants the bishop and priest between them could have an opportunity to administer things were looking desperate indeed and bishop ridley's ears must have tingled at what he heard of deprecation and disapproval of his hasty and ill-considered action finally the bishop was told to hasten back to his distant sea and move heaven and earth to get mr duncan to come back into the fold with his mission and indians to make all possible promises and amends to promise to move away from metlakatla if necessary in short metlakatla the most precious crown jewel in the diadem of, of missionary achievements of the church missionary society lost by the indiscretion of the bishop must now at whatever cost be recovered the bishop came back from victoria he wrote mr duncan made him all kinds of propositions some showing such a small contemptible mind that they could not help making a man of the sterling moral solidity of mr duncan recoil all in vain mr duncan's one answer was too late in a white community of nine hundred and forty-eight souls for that was found to be the exact number of inhabitants at metlakatla when a few years later a census was taken it would not be expected that there could not be found some one who would not stand steadfast through all temptations for at any length of time some one had said about the tsimsheans the indians are no better than the white men it was therefore not strange if the wonderful unanimity should in time be slightly broken there were at metlakatla some people who had not lived such consistent lives as christians should they had been rebuked and reprimanded by mr duncan some of them publicly a few of them were former chiefs who felt slighted they were not made much of and were in fact kept down their ambition had been wounded by the stern and determined man at the head of the colony who knew no other merit than christian virtue it took but little inducement small attentions once in a while a little stirring in the hardly healed wound which still smarted at times to fan into flame the smouldering embers of dissatisfaction in these minds so after four or five months there was really a bishop's party at metlakatla consisting of four or five adults a majority of them so-called ex-chiefs one of them at least an ex-convict and ticket-of-leave man whose freedom from jail mr duncan held in the hollow of his hand i need not say that he never exercised the privilege he would not be the man he is if he had this was all the bishop wanted he at last had acquired a party at metlakatla on the very day of the rupture he had approached mr duncan's native teacher david leask a sterling man and able christian who till the day of his death was a leader and a giant among his people and offered him as a bribe a salary one-third larger than what he had if he would forsake mr duncan's leadership and accept work for the society under the bishop's orders but leask poor as he was spurned the tempter on his return from england the bishop was more successful in corrupting mr duncan's white teacher an englishman who had been paid by mr duncan out of his own private funds since the severance from the society a female indian assistant in the school did not have the power to resist which david leask had shown when she also was tempted by the bishop to give up her school for a consideration she deserted mr duncan thus he thought to interfere with mr duncan's school work and for a time really partly succeeded in this his next scheme was to cripple the resources of the metlakatlans 
upon his return he let it be assiduously understood that mr duncan a lone insignificant man never could successfully stand out against the society which he was very careful to impress on their minds had an annual income of over a million dollars now the indians were to feel the truth of this the main income of the metlakatlans enabling them to run their village their school and their church as well as their other enterprises came from the village store which now had been organized on a cooperative plan what does the bishop do but use the society's means in procuring a stock of goods placing them for sale in the mission house and selling them at cost price here again these splendid natives spurned the serpent's bribe not one of them could be induced to leave their own store and buy goods at a much smaller price from the bishop oh for such character among our white christians but the bishop's scheme did partially succeed the neighboring tribes whose trade constituted quite an item in the store's business were to some extent tempted by the cunning bribe in the nature of lower prices and the village store lost quite a large proportion of its usual annual profits but thank god the work was able to survive this blow also as showing the bishop's haughty and arrogant disposition i cite the following after his return the village council passed a resolution stating that it did not desire him to reside in the village a letter containing this resolution was handed him by a native he met him took the letter and without opening it tore it into pieces threw the fragments down and trampled on them when another man called with a second letter he summoned him into the house led the way to the fireplace and threw the letter unread into the flames how little he attempted to follow in the footsteps of the great prince of peace whose servant he was supposed to be is apparent from his own account given in one of his reports the medicine men at some mission station had disturbed him by their noise he says i stepped quickly up to the chief performer took him by the shoulders and before he could recover his self-possession had him at the river brink and assured him i would assist him further down next time i wonder how many heathen indians mr duncan would have succeeded in converting at an earlier day if his method of procedure had been tainted with the bishop's muscular christianity the next move of the bishop was to call for a warship to come up to cow the indians into submission to his lordship the village store was built close to the mission house no part of the society's funds had been used in its erection but the bishop now had commenced to set up a claim that all that was built and started by mr duncan from private contributions sent him was the society's property mr duncan in eighteen eighty five stated that all such contributions from the very first up to that date amounted in all not to exceed six thousand dollars and as against this he showed the cost and maintenance of the church twelve thousand nine hundred fifty nine dollars establishing new industries eleven thousand four hundred twenty six dollars village improvements three thousand forty dollars and aid furnished the villagers in building their new houses seven thousand two hundred and thirty eight dollars for a total expenditure of thirty four thousand six hundred sixty three dollars the indians after having sought legal advice as to their rights in the premises concluded to move the village store away from the undesirable proximity to the mission house where the bishop resided when they undertook to do this in a peaceable and quiet way the bishop who in the meantime had secured a magistrate's commission got up and read the riot act to them and immediately sent such an alarming report of the occurrence to victoria that the authorities dared not wait till they could get hold of one of their own warships but prevailed upon the united states government to send up the revenue cutter oliver wolcott with two magistrates they at once upon arrival proceeded to investigate the so-called riot but came to the conclusion that on the crown's own evidence there had been no riot and therefore dismissed the case but before the revenue cutter arrived further troubles had arisen the riot act had been read by the bishop on the thirtieth of november eighteen eighty two on the eighteenth of december some one of the bishop's party had bought a drum from one of the indians as he was only part owner of the drum with six or seven others they objected to the sale and wanted mr duncan's help to get it back 
mr duncan wrote to mr collison who refused to return it and recommended a lawsuit this of course was a small matter but there was at the time so much bad blood in the camp that it did not require anything very great to create a row at metlakahtla mr duncan who did not want to exercise his powers of a magistrate where he feared he might be prejudiced sent the boys to a justice at fort simpson but he afraid of the bishop and the church would not take up the case mr duncan and mr collison then agreed to submit the matter to the bishop he consented to act but put the complainants off perhaps because they were then in the midst of the christmas festivities it had been agreed that in the meantime the drum should not be used but when a boy contrary to the terms of this agreement appeared on the street with the bone of contention two of the part owners took the drum away from him the bishop who had not been in any hurry up to this time now became very much aroused and at once on december twenty sixth issued his warrant for the two malfeasers when brought before him he without any examination or hearing on his own motion sent them to jail there to remain until january second his excuse was that he wanted to have it determined as to the ownership of the drum before their hearing the indians with a keen appreciation of the rights of an accused person to a speedy trial at once called a meeting without the knowledge or presence of mr duncan at this meeting it was voted to send a delegation to the bishop and request him to give the men an immediate trial on proceeding to the bishop's house for this purpose the delegation espied him coming up the street and concluded to wait for him one of the delegates an old man held up his hand as the bishop was nearing and said stop bishop the bishop pushed the old man aside but one of the others a young man named paul legaic the old chief's nephew stepped out onto the road and said no bishop don't do that we want to talk to you why do you not try the two men before sending them to jail the bishop did not answer the question but struck the young man a blow he was a strong powerful man and could have annihilated the bishop and did in fact lift his hand when one of the others said no don't strike back let him go he followed the advice and did not touch the bishop one of the party robert hewson a humorous and gifted young man now a highly respectable and influential citizen of new metlakahtla could not hold back an odious comparison he stepped up to the bishop and taking hold of his right hand said bishop this hand baptize indian this hand fight indian the bishop in his rage gave him a violent blow on the chest with such force as to throw him against another indian jacob bolton that was more than hewson could stand he had a temper as well as the bishop and he struck back once at the same time jacob bolton whose nose was bleeding from the blow he had received when hewson was pushed against him started in earnest to give the bishop what he evidently was looking for this was a signal for the whole crowd to take a hand and the bishop would undoubtedly have fared very badly had it not been for mr duncan's constables who rushed in pushed the crowd aside and rescued the bishop with the warning words to the men christians must not fight better suffer wrong but the bishop struck first well let him do that but not we we must show him that we are christians the bishop now went to the mission house the crowd started to the jail and released the prisoners when the magistrates came up on the riot case this whole drum trouble with all its ramifications was brought before them legaic had in vain sought redress for the bishop's unprovoked assault upon him as mr duncan felt a delicacy about taking the matter up and the fort simpson justice to whom he sent the young man was on too good terms with the bishop to take any steps against him at the hearing before the magistrates the bishop swore that he was set upon by a mob of two hundred and fifty indians it was clearly proven however that there were not over twenty or twenty-five indians present he also swore that the old indian had first struck him this testimony he however at a subsequent hearing changed to a greater consistency with the truth at the hearing the drum the miserable cause of it all was restored to its rightful owners robert hewson was fined ten dollars as being guilty of a technical assault by taking hold of the bishop's hand when making his humorous remark and another indian was also fined a similar sum 
the prisoners and their liberators were discharged as their imprisonment by the bishop was held to be illegal as might be expected nothing was done to the bishop he was a little too high up for that these actions on the part of the bishop so irritated the indians and created so much bad blood that after this it seemed that both parties just watched for an opportunity for getting at the other and stirring up trouble sometimes undoubtedly one side was in the wrong sometimes the other most of the time both of them small insignificant trifles were made use of to try to down the other side and every six months or so the bishop called for another warship and for the commissioners and magistrates it had been calculated that his efforts to fight mr duncan and the indians of the mission have cost the province of british columbia not less than thirty thousand dollars in cold cash and in order to hold the fort and gain twelve or fifteen families which was the total result of five years intrigue and most godless warfare the society was made to spend another thirty thousand dollars of mission money at metlakahtla they had long had a by-law forbidding the erection of any building unless the consent of the council had first been obtained one of the bishop's followers disregarded this by-law and irritated the council by following his teacher's example and saying publicly that he would build just whatever and wherever he pleased without asking the council the indians now made a mistake instead of prosecuting him they went to his place and pulled down the few scantlings he had erected but improper as this action was it would hardly seem to warrant the bishop's calling for another warship on these poor people but he did it came and with it a magistrate and an indian agent that such a condition of things was not very favourable to the growth of christian life of the indians follows of itself that the people involved in this petty warfare and miserable intrigue indulged in more or less on both sides did not lose their religion altogether is a surprise to all who know anything about it and a living proof of the genuineness and earnestness with which the seed had been planted an occurrence like the one to be mentioned makes the heart sick before one of the numerous commissioners sent up on the warships to investigate metlakahtla affairs the bishop who had paraded through the streets armed with a rifle so that mr duncan was obliged to request him in writing to desist as he could not be responsible for what might result from such action during the excited and troublous times in which they were living testified that he had been fired at it was night the shot passed through a window close by him he distinctly heard the report of the gun and chased the two villains in the dark but was outrun the following morning the bullet was found in the room all of this was sheer imagination there had been no gun fired at all the young man of the bishop's own party had in sport intended to toss a small pistol bullet at the wall of the bishop's house for the purpose of scaring a young girl he saw at the window unfortunately he missed his mark and the bullet happened to fly in through the window of the room in which the bishop was sitting at the time that was all there was to it to put the case very mildly what must one think of a man with an imagination as lively as that the fight seemed now simply to have come down to a question of endurance in power to invent causes for trouble between the bishop and the indians at one time when there happened to be nothing else in the wind the indians took possession of the schoolhouse as a test case as they called it though mr duncan had at first been inclined to make no claim to the building inasmuch as the government had contributed the small sum of two hundred dollars towards its erection this meant simply another warship seven men were tried four of them held by the magistrates and sent to victoria to languish in jail for several months when the case against them was dropped or dismissed by the grand jury which severely criticized the magistrates for allowing themselves to be made tools of by the bishop the names of the men who thus were made to suffer as the first metlakahtla martyrs jailed at victoria are to-day emblazoned on the roll of honor of the metlakahtla indians and to preserve their names in history they are here given cornelius hudson dennis malone charles spencer and edward k mather end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of the apostle of alaska story of william duncan of metlakahtla by john w arctander 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Last Blow But the bitterest fight was to come. The bishop had always claimed ownership of the society to the two acres of ground on which the mission buildings were erected. The provincial government of British Columbia had, of late, set up the claim, opposed to the general trend of the policy of Canada, as well as of the United States, in dealing with the Indian claims that the Indians had no rights in the lands which they and their ancestors had been in possession of for centuries before the advent of the white man, and they were wholly dependent for permission to occupy any lands upon all the grace and bounty of the Queen in order to gain the support and aid of the provincial government in his war upon these indians who refused to submit to his lordship's benign rule the bishop now turned traitor to the interests of all the indians in the province sided with the land grabbers and the local government in their unjust claims and demanded that the government by virtue of its sole title and ownership of the pretended indian lands survey and set aside to the missionary society the two acres at the mission point above mentioned this was more than the indians could stand those who had posed as would-be shepherds and protectors now ready to turn and rob them of their patrimony the war cloud commenced to hover over the entire indian horizon in british columbia and no one could tell what the end would be but mr duncan now stepped forward he assured the indians that the dominion government never would sanction such a policy and advised that an appeal be made to it in obedience to this voice of peace which never had been lifted against the indians those in the western part of the province elected three delegates two of them leading men of metlakatla john tate and edward k mather to accompany mr duncan to ottawa in order to invoke the intercession of the dominion government anent the attacks of the province on the ancient indian rights and privileges so eloquently did mr duncan and his delegation plead the cause of the indians that sir john macdonald the premier of canada promised not only to prevail upon the church missionary society to withdraw entirely from metlakatla but also to grant the indians of the province full relief from their oppressors he asked mr duncan to lay before him in writing a plan for the relief of the indian grievances this he did this plan involved the appointment of a local superintendent of indian affairs in direct connection with the dominion government sir john heartily approved of the plan which he admitted furnished a key to the only practical solution of the difficult indian question hitherto presented and promised to carry the scheme through at the next session of the dominion parliament but he said there is one difficulty unless we could secure the services of yourself as superintendent i would despair of a successful issue very well said mr duncan to help the indians out i will consent to act as superintendent for one year on condition however i receive no salary good answered sir john that settles it in six months your proposed plan shall be the law of the land that being the case I think it would be better for me not to return to Metlakatla until your plans have been fully matured, since for me to go back there under these circumstances would only fan the flame, which I hope we now, with your aid, will entirely subdue. All I ask you, then, is to give the Indian delegates your assurance that the matter will be settled the way they have through me asked. This was done. Mr. Duncan went to England, there to await developments and the delegates returned home filled with hope that the queen's government would give them their rights and fulfil the solemn pledges theretofore made the indians by lord dufferin the governor-general and her majesty's representative in canada they cheerfully reported to the other indians at home the fine promises of sir john poor deluded indians they did not know that a politician's promises are like ropes of sand one day they should find out that sir john macdonald was only a politician and that his word of honour though solemnly given was not worth a picayune in london mr duncan again had an audience with sir john in which the same promises were reiterated and wherein he told him that he had written the society and had met a committee from it in london on the matter and had strictly adhered to his former demands that they abandon metlakatla at once before leaving london however sir john had a second conference with the society 
after which he entirely changed front went back on all his solemn promises to mr duncan and the indians and in his official report soon thereafter issued appeared in the role of a defender of the bishop and an accuser of mr duncan who now in his eyes had become an intolerable dictator people have been malicious enough to insinuate that at this second interview a bargain was entered into between this christian no pardon me church missionary society and sir john by the terms of which he in consideration of a complete surrender of the rights of the indians secured the support of the sympathizers of the church of england party of canada in the approaching general election which was to decide his fate and that of his party mr duncan waited the stipulated six months he heard nothing when eight months had gone by and no tidings he returned by way of ottawa sought an interview with sir john but could not get it he then wrote a letter to the deputy minister of indian affairs who promised to write him an answer to metlakahtla but no answer came he then again wrote from metlakahtla to sir john no answer not even an acknowledgment of the receipt of his letter which the commonest courtesy certainly would require instead of an answer to these letters came in the fall of eighteen eighty six a surveying party set out by the dominion government itself to survey what it was pleased to allow the indians for a reserve though no treaty or agreement had ever been made with them for ceding the land which they were now called upon to surrender the indians felt that the time had now come for them to assert their rights or to lie down like cowards and be robbed of all their patrimony so they concluded to prevent the surveyors from going on with their work this they did however without any violence though often sorely provoked by the insolence of the surveying party they simply did it in this way whenever the surveyor planted his instrument the indians took it up and laid it down when the surveyor drove a stake the indians pulled it up when the surveyor laid a chain the indians took it away but they kept it up all the time i can well afford to admit that this was a great mistake nothing could be gained by actions of this sort except what happened after the lapse of some time to wit the arrival of another warship and the deportation of seven of the leaders in the interference john tate edward k mather fred ridley alfred atkinson adolphus calvert moses baines and james smith and their subsequent incarceration in jail in victoria for from three to six months but we should remember that it was not easy for mr duncan to have their untutored minds grasp any two fine distinctions where they felt their innate rights so shamefully distorted and played with the indians in order to get a test case in the law courts about the two acres claimed by the society about the same time erected a small building on a portion of them and put a man in possession this action finally forced the bishop to start an injunction or mandamus proceeding in the courts in victoria to compel the tearing down of this offensive little building mr duncan who had gone down to victoria after the survey trouble to see if nothing could be done to prevent the dispatch of another warship to metlakahtla and in some way secure some amicable arrangement of the land trouble was present in court when chief justice begbie announced his decision granting the bishop's application in doing so he not only took pains to state from the bench that the indians had no rights in the land except such as might be accorded to them by the bounty and charity of the queen of england but also as it seems to me in a very improper and injudicious manner characterized the utterances of lord dufferin wherein he pledged her majesty's government to protect and recognize the rights of the indians in and to their land as simple blarney for the mob mr duncan who still would be detained in victoria for some time on matters concerning metlakahtla wrote the exact language of the judge to the rev r tomlinson who in the year eighteen eighty two had resigned from the society's service and at mr duncan's and the indians earnest request a short time after his resignation had come to metlakahtla with his lovable family mr duncan built a fine house for him anent his coming and ever since that time mr tomlinson had been mr duncan's faithful and indefatigable co-worker at old metlakahtla and undoubtedly a mighty comfort to him in the many trials and tribulations which he during these years was destined to endure 
as soon as mr duncan's letter arrived and its contents had been communicated to the leaders a meeting was called of the indians as to what there was done we will learn later on about two weeks after writing to metlakahtla mr duncan to his surprise heard that the steamer from the north had brought down some of his indians he went to meet them and found david leask robert hewson and josiah guthrie at the wharf they looked solemn mysterious and glum when he wanted to know their errand they refused to talk then they all three threw suspicious fearful glances at the people near by indicating to him that they feared everybody and trusted no one finally upon being informed that they would not speak till the next day and then only if they could meet him all alone where nobody could overhear he made an appointment with them for the next forenoon at senator macdonald's beautiful home armadale the government of british columbia at the time consisted of a premier an attorney-general and a secretary at ten o'clock the same evening mr duncan called at the house of the secretary mr robson the only one of the members of the government who seemed to have any conscience about the treatment of the indians mr duncan said to him when alone with him in his library a delegation of indians has just arrived from the north to see me they are reticent and will not tell me their errand i am afraid this bodes no good i come to you now for the last time to see if nothing can be done to stop this trouble i can speak now for i know nothing to-morrow after i have seen them and know what they have concluded to do my mouth will probably be sealed so i can tell you nothing there are only one of two decisions that i can imagine they could have come to one is to leave for alaska if it be that all is good and well if you hear to-morrow night that i have left for the states you may know that it is alaska but if i do not i am afraid that it means fight and if it does may god have mercy on the white people of this province you will need to send five thousand men up there and they will go there only to be killed too the indians will withdraw up the skeena river and all the military you can send up there will be simply slaughtered in the canyons while the indians will go comparatively free your treasury will be depleted your population will be murdered your soldiers will be slaughtered but if it is fight don't come to me any more don't try to get me to do anything for i will not i am going to leave you all to your fate now i have pleaded and preached and prayed till i am sick at heart at the injustice you have showered on those poor indians it is terrible to contemplate said mr robeson but we have deserved it i admit it i admit it End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakahtla by john w ark tander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the new home the next evening mr robeson learned that mr duncan had left for washington the members of the government slept easier that night mr duncan says it grieved me to hear when i returned from washington that the premier was dead the magnificent house which this ex-farmer was building for himself in victoria stood there half finished and now abandoned the attorney general was dying and could not be seen since then every one connected with his crying injustice has died the vengeance is mine saith the lord at the meeting of the indians at metlakahtla so it was afterwards learned a great conflict had been raging many wanted to take up arms and martial feeling ran high it seemed to these people as if there was nothing to live for now justice had been denied them everywhere by ministers and governors and premiers and now at last by the courts their final hope their last resort the church was harassing them the state was incarcerating them and stealing the possessions which they had inherited from the fathers of their fathers we might as well make a last stand they said just as well first as last just as well fight and kill and die as to have these highway robbers take away from us the land which our fathers possessed for hundreds of years before a white man put a foot in british columbia the more earnest christians pleaded for alaska a christian can suffer he can die but he cannot kill they said let us go to the great land of the free we are slaves here there we can be free men 
we love this land we love this beautiful place where our fathers lived and where our children were born but we love christ more two wrongs cannot make one right let us go to alaska where we can worship god as we think right where there will be no bishop to worry and tantalize us where as mr duncan tells us every one can have his own religion without any persecution either from church or government let us go to a peaceful life to a life in god and the christians won the day the delegation was sent down to ask mr duncan to go to washington and ascertain if the metlakahtla indians would be allowed to come to alaska to seek a refuge there from their troubles and whether they would be received as citizens of the country and be protected in their rights if so they were willing to go and leave all go where they would be free to worship their god as their consciences dictated without interference or worry from priest bishop or society mr duncan thought it best first to appeal to some christian friends in this country of whom he had read before addressing the proper officers of the government at washington and to ascertain from them the best modus operandi and he did not appeal in vain to grand warm-hearted men like the silver-tongued episcopalian bishop phillips brooks in boston and the patriotic henry ward beecher in brooklyn both of them opened their magnificent churches for him and gave him their moral support in a unanimous request by their congregations to our government to grant these homeless indians a refuge in our alaskan archipelago arrived at washington he was received by the representatives of our government president cleveland his secretary of state and of the interior and his attorney general with friendly feelings and assured privately that he and his indians were welcome to choose themselves a home in alaska and that in time undoubtedly some action would be taken by the congress fully to secure them in their rights if they themselves would select an island suitable to their purposes but that officially nothing could at the time be done which might be construed by great britain as an unfriendly act to the canadian government or to the government of any of its provinces this promise was honorably redeemed when in eighteen ninety one at the solicitation of these same government officials as well as of the then governor of alaska the congress of the united states did by the act of march thirty eighteen ninety one until otherwise provided by law set apart the body of land known as the annette islands in alexander archipelago in southeastern alaska as a reservation for the use of the metlakahtla indians and such other of the alaska natives as may join them to be held and used by them in common under such rules and regulations and subject to such restrictions as may be prescribed from time to time by the secretary of the interior mr duncan never overlooks anything he had foreseen the possibility of his people being obliged to emigrate to alaska in order to enjoy religious and civic liberty and for that contingency he had already looked up where eligible and desirable sites for the new colony might be found as soon as it was made apparent to him that a way would be opened to their immigration to alaska he wrote to mr tomlinson and to dr j d bluett duncan a devoted christian gentleman of means from england who had at home read about the wonderful colony built up under mr duncan's fostering care and some two or three years before had come out to sea with his own eyes and had remained to give the indians without cost or charge the benefit of his professional services and in other ways to give mr duncan what assistance he could mr duncan's letter suggested that a deputation of indians should go at once and examine certain eligible sites for a new colony which he suggested and select the one that seemed to them best this was done at once five indians accompanied by dr bluett duncan started on a voyage of exploration seventy miles north of the old village on the other side of dixon entrance they came to port chester on the northwest side of annette island the beautiful waterfall giving promise of a splendid water power the sheltered bay the fine canoe beaches the gently rising stretch of land directly back of the beach the luxurious growth of cedars spruce and hemlock all won upon their eyes and one of the indians said it is no use to go any further we can certainly not find anything finer than this if we go a thousand miles this voiced the opinion of all 
thus on the twenty fifth day of march eighteen eighty seven one of the loveliest spots in alaska was selected as the new home in the country of the brave and the free for the persecuted and hounded metlakatla indians here under the protection of the stars and stripes this race which had already made such wonderful strides in civilization christian virtues and civic progress should recover from the cruel blows given it by bigotry and priestcraft and its little village should blossom forth in peace and prosperity as the model christian community of alaska the far-away northland its fame to redound into all lands and among all people the indians who had the honor of selecting this new home of the colony were david leask john tate edward benson adam gordon and fred ridley the explorers at once returned to their home and made a glowing report of what they had found the selection was in a short time ratified by all thanks be to god peace should once more reign among them strife and vexatious irritation and continuous brawling should cease happiness shone in every face word was sent to mr duncan notifying him of their selection of the new home soon pioneers were dispatched to build temporary huts near the beach while the rest of the villagers went on their usual summer tours to gather and put up the winter supply of food july gone and the canoes returning many started directly for the new home to assist in the work of erecting the temporary houses on august seventh eighteen eighty seven about noon a gun announced the arrival of the steamer ancon it brought mr duncan who landed at once accompanied by some american gentlemen on board a temporary flagstaff was rigged up and under the boom of a cannon the stars and stripes were hoisted for the first time on that shore the indians with solemn mien uncovered their heads as the silken banner a present from friends in the states slowly rose above them and unfurled to the breeze of the most beautiful colors any nation could ever boast of speeches were made by the hon h r dawson united states commissioner of education and by mr duncan but more eloquent than the speeches were the silent tears glistening in the eyes of the stalwart indians as they were looking admiringly up at the flag under whose protecting folds the future of their little nation was to be lived they spoke of the untold sufferings and sorrows of the past years they also spoke eloquently of the living hope of the relief the future would bring and with silent praise to god for their deliverance there arose to the throne of the almighty at that moment i am told from those indian hearts many a wish for the success of the great nation which now held its protecting banner above the little persecuted flock since that day there are four great holidays celebrated at metlakatla every year christmas day the birth of the christ new year's day the birth of the year fourth of july the birth of the nation and the seventh of august pioneer day as it is called the birthday of new metlakatla for so was the new haven of rest christened at three o'clock that day divine services were held on the beach the first conducted by mr duncan in american alaska then in song and praise and prayer in the soft flowing language of the tsimsheans the native heart was lifted up to and beyond the beautiful flag now floating above their heads into the holy of holies of the glorious heavens the next morning while mr duncan's effects including a complete steam sawmill outfit which he had brought in portland were unloaded and stored in the log house built for him filling it to overflowing he himself was compelled to live in a tent during the first fall months george usher a prominent native was by him sent back to old metlakatla to bring the indians there news of the arrival of their leader as george usher ploughed the blue sapphire waves of the north pacific with his paddle he composed a song or chant with which to greet his people when he arrived in the inlet at old metlakatla he did not run his canoe up on the beach indian fashion he stopped a little distance from shore where he rested on his paddle some one on shore espied and recognized him like lightning the message flew through the village the steamer which was supposed to carry the chief had been seen pass by going north a couple of days ago in the twinkling of an eye it seemed the beach was black with people who swarmed out of their homes and yards men women and children the whole village was there even some of the bishop's party ventured forth 
then came over the waves in words of song the glad message in their own beloved tongue the great chief has come he has gone to our new home now he sends me to you he bids you come one and all we shall be slaves no longer the land of freedom has accepted us the flag of the boston men is hoisted at the sight of a new metlakatla it will protect us and our freedom we can worship god in peace we can secure the happiness of our children they will be the freemen of a great nation come therefore one and all gather your little ones around you push the canoes from the beach good wind will fill our sails we will hasten to the land of freedom hardly had the last note died away over the waves when the scraping of the canoe keels on the sand was heard in less than an hour ten canoes filled with men anxious to see with their own eyes their new home were on the way after temporary log huts were erected the return voyage was made and now as the pilgrim fathers of old they came back with women and children and with what little of their possessions they were allowed to take in canoe fleets towed across dixon entrance by their little cannery steamer princess louise and by the methodist gospel boat glad tidings chartered for the occasion it stands to reason that many a tear glistened in the indians black eyes as they left their old home where their fathers had lived for generations back where their children had been born where they themselves had seen the great light and been received into christ's church on earth where they left so many of their dear departed behind but though cruel persecution asserted itself at the very last moment and denied them the right to take along even the windows and doors of the houses they themselves had built the sawmill machinery and the lathes and other machinery they had owned the looms they had bought and paid for the very organ in their church to which every indian had contributed his two dollars and fifty cents or five hundred dollars in all the carpet which their women had provided for their church after the rupture the prows of their canoes were headed north towards the land of freedom towards a haven of rest from petty spite and persecution and the sobs of parting were choked down and the brows lifted in hope and courage in that hour big with the future all was soon forgotten but the glorious hope of the morrow lying ahead of them though deprived of all they had toiled for during a lifetime though smarting under the cruel injustice which had in the name of holy church taken from them what was theirs and driven them from hearth and home appropriated their houses and gardens their church and school without a penny of compensation nevertheless this host of christians went forth to a strange land in their heart of hearts glad to sacrifice what they did for the sake of their faith and religion and smiling through their tears quite eight hundred and twenty three of the nine hundred forty eight constituting the population of the village left that fall for new metlakatla some who did not belong to the bishop's party remained not because they sympathized with him but because they had not the moral courage to pull up stakes and start again in a strange land the real strength of the bishop's party did not at the time muster over ninety four counting in his white retainers he and his followers did not hesitate to reap where they had not sown it was said that it was with a look of satisfaction the bishop contemplated his victory that he actually smiled when he saw these poor natives driven from home and all that was theirs had they not dared to oppose his divine lordship and now he and his adherents took possession theirs was the church and the school and the mission house and the weavery and the cannery and the sawmill the store and the factories and the buildings and mr duncan's own house paid for out of his own private funds all all was theirs with none to dispute their title as the last fleet of canoes glided away over the placid waves of the inlet carrying those who had come to fetch some portion of what had belonged to them but who now were compelled to return with empty hands because the state's aid had not in vain been invoked by the church but had stayed their hands from taking what was theirs i fancy i can hear a satanic ha <laughs> ha echoing back from the mountain peaks as the bishop contemplated all the possessions which he had found on his hands but what easily comes easily goes the proverb says one day in nineteen o one fire from heaven devoured all the bishop's ill-gotten gains the magnificent church the school the cannery the factory buildings 
the mission house practically everything that had been stolen from these poor people went up in smoke carrying with it the bishop's private possessions his books and his manuscripts in fact all that he owned indeed mr duncan could say vengeance is mine saith the lord since that time the society has in nineteen o three built a small church it has built the ridley house a boarding school for half-breed indian children which still is in operation everything has been done by the provincial government to foster old metlakahtla and keep the dying mission there going a school for boys and a school for girls have been built and operated by the aid of ludicrously excessive grants from the government but it seems that the end of this artificial hothouse gardening has now come the government did in nineteen o eight withdraw its support and both of the schools are now deserted the furniture was sold at auction in the summer of that year the new day school building erected by the government and just finished this summer will be wholly useless as there are school buildings enough and to spare for the present population which according to the figures furnished me by the indian agent totals one hundred eighty seven including the boarders at the schools of the many assistants of bishop ridley there now remain at old metlakahtla only the venerable missionary the rev j h keene who when i visited there during the summer of nineteen o eight acted as his own schoolmaster as well and miss m west the principal of the ridley home bishop duvernay has moved his episcopal seat to prince rupert a new town in the making on a neighboring island and the intended terminus of the grand trunk pacific railway the metlakahtla indians still remaining at old metlakahtla had a windfall a year or so ago when the railroad company paid them something in the neighborhood of fifty thousand dollars to acquire their reservation interest in the lands on which prince rupert is to be partly located this money has by these indians been invested in modern dwelling houses End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakahtla by john w r tander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schempf. the pioneers at new metlakahtla the pioneers found work enough before them the dense primeval forest extended down to the beach the giant trees all the way from one to six feet in diameter quite a distance from the ground had to be felled stumps removed the land cleared and ground drained before the permanent allotment of town lots could be made they all went at it with a will while there had many years ago been a small clinket village at the spot the only evidence of it now was an old totem pole which has since been removed and now is found in the museum at sitka one of the first public buildings to be erected was the sawmill where a plant was installed and kept busy sawing the lumber for temporary buildings as well as for use the next summer in the erection of a cannery building as to permanent dwellings the edict of mr duncan was that none should be built for the first two years he was afraid that some of those who had come might desire to return to the fleshpots of old metlakahtla after a while and he did not desire that they should be held back by having permanent and costly improvements the same spirit was over him as of old there was to be no discontent all should be footloose so that they could pull up and go back if their hearts were not in it in spite of this only two or three families returned one of his first acts was to gather the adult men together and explain to them their duties to the new country which had received them so kindly it was a sight worth witnessing when in the faint glimmer of the oil lamps all these swarthy men young and old at the behest of their beloved leader who already held a magistrate's commission one evening held up their right hands and with a patriotic glow in their eyes solemnly and collectively swore allegiance to their adopted country the proceeding was not authorized by law but mr duncan knew that it would as far as the indians were concerned have just the same effect as had it been a legal proceeding he wanted to bind them at once with the ties of allegiance to the new country the next thing to do was to draft and adopt a constitution for the new community which every resident of the village had to accept and sign 
before he could be considered as having any rights there the result of mr duncan's labors in that direction was the following declaration of residence we the people of metlakatla alaska in order to secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of a christian home do severally subscribe to the following rules for the regulation of our conduct and town affairs one to reverence the sabbath and to refrain from all unnecessary secular work on that day to attend divine worship to take the bible for our rule of faith to regard all true christians as our brethren and to be truthful honest and industrious two to be faithful and loyal to the government and laws of the united states three to render our votes when called upon for the election of the town council and to promptly obey the by-laws and orders imposed by the said council four to attend to the education of our children and keep them at school as regularly as possible five to totally abstain from all intoxicants and gambling and never to attend heathen festivities or countenance heathen customs in surrounding villages six to strictly carry out all sanitary regulations necessary for the health of the town seven to identify ourselves with the progress of the settlement and to utilize the land we hold eight never to alienate give away or sell our land or building lots or any portion thereof to any person or persons who have not subscribed to these rules this constitution has never been changed or amended and is faithfully lived up to unto the present time after the ground had been cleared and drained the village was surveyed and a plan made of the blocks and streets here again the wonderful wisdom of mr duncan showed itself all envy and jealousy must be kept out of the new community so in making up the town plat he divided every block into four lots of eighty by ninety in order that every native householder should have a corner lot but now came the question how to distribute the different lots so that there would be no trouble there was a preference of course the lots facing the beach or rather the public street running immediately above and along the beach were the best and the handiest for a population which spent half its life in the canoe or boat the first method of distribution was by the drawing of lots but the result convinced mr duncan that it would not give satisfaction so thinking it over during the night he evolved another mode which he felt sure would be successful calling them together the next day he announced that all done the day before would have to be annulled i am not going to have you feel badly towards each other if i can help it he said now i have thought out this plan the oldest brother in each family chooses his lot first then the second the third and the fourth then if there are more the same proceeding is resorted to in the block back of the front block etc if you do not then get what you want don't blame me but blame yourselves for not having come into the world any sooner than you did the humor of this parting shot took hold of the indian mind and the plan worked satisfactorily the rev r tomlinson mr duncan's faithful co-worker at old metlakatla for the past five years came over to the new place for a few weeks but as he could not find any conveniences for his large family he left them behind in mr duncan's house at the former home after consultation they came to the agreement that mr duncan as he now would not be called away from the settlement to fight the battles of the natives against the bishop's continuous and sinister attacks could perhaps get along alone and as mr tomlinson was anxious to take up again at the first opportunity his work among the upper skeena river timsians the jonathan and david of the coast had an affectionate parting and mr tomlinson thereafter located at mayonskin nisht the foot of the pitch pines where he ever since has continued to carry on a blessed work on his own account without the support of any mission society the fruits of this work will perhaps never be fully known until that great day when our accounts up yonder are finally closed dr blewett duncan also accompanied mr duncan to the land of freedom and for more than five years not only gave them the benefit of his christian sympathy and practical advice but also relieved him at a time when his attention was greatly needed in other directions of the duty of giving medical attendance to the sick 
it stands to reason that by the persecutions to which mr duncan and the metlakatlans had been exposed at the hands of both church and state in british america and by their being deprived of their property as well as of the fruits of years of labor and saving their funds were not in very excellent state to withstand the drain of removal and of building up anew their little town while mr duncan has always been averse to asking any help whatsoever from any one friends were by god in this their hour of need mainly by the valuable assistance of henry s welcome a wealthy englishman who at his own expense published and spread broadcast a book on the glorious work of mr duncan raised up both in america and england with the result that within two years of the removal to alaska the benevolent fund as mr duncan has styled it had reached the sum of six thousand five hundred ninety one dollars and fifty five cents at midnight on june twenty eighth eighteen eighty nine the colony had the misfortune to see the destruction by fire of their sawmill and of all their sawed and dressed lumber entailing a loss of over twelve thousand dollars as there was no insurance on july tenth mr duncan was already on his way to portland to purchase machinery for a new mill it is evident that it had not taken a long time to make an american of him though he was not then possessed of the means with which to pay for it he felt the absolute necessity of quick action if the building up of the new village should not receive a serious setback he succeeded in getting the extra time allowed him in less than three months from the date of the fire a new mill of greater capacity was running at full blast and by the following may friends in america had contributed anent this loss the sum of six thousand sixty nine dollars ninety two cents thus covering about half the actual misfortune practically all of this amount had been raised through the magnificent efforts of the hon e j thomas of brooklyn massachusetts who has since gone home to his father's house in the meantime the building lots distributed had been deeded to the persons entitled to them by the village council on payment of a three dollar fee which was covered into the treasury the lots were being cleared fences built berry and vegetable gardens started and the building of permanent houses commenced the dwellings were mostly square two-story buildings built of dressed lumber and provided with verandas and porches in march eighteen ninety one mr duncan could report that ninety one substantial new dwellings had been erected the number of dwellings in the village today is one hundred and thirty every year of late some of the residents have discarded their old homes and built new houses most of them however have been concerned as far as the improvement of their property goes in freshly painting their dwellings and putting in new picket fences around their lots even among the houses built of late years the square two-story building style seems to be the one predominating but a few of the more recently built homes would in style and arrangement do honor to any little new england village of its size among them may be mentioned tom hanbury's house built in nineteen o two painted dark green with white trimmings alex guthrie's bungalow built in nineteen o three painted pink with white trimmings and dark red shingled roof and benjamin a haldane's house built in nineteen o six and painted orange with white trimmings and dark green shingled roof the monument in front of his house was placed there in honor of his deceased father matthew haldane one of mr duncan's most trusted friends who is not however laid to rest at this place he was buried in the cemetery end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w ark tander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf a day at metlakatla among the industries started at new metlakatla was a printing establishment one of the natives was sent to portland to learn typesetting and printing and a small outfit of type and hand press were procured on this press was within a year after the flitting from british columbia printed a little hymn book or church manual as the title page styles it of thirty-six pages containing eleven hymns in english fourteen hymns in Timshian, part of them translations from well-known english church hymns 
and part original compositions by mr duncan the ten commandments the golden rule and some fifty suitable selections from the scriptures in english and the lord's prayer and the apostolic benediction in tsimshian on this printing press also was printed from time to time with intervals of from two months to one year eight numbers of a little four-page two-column ten by seven paper the metlakatlan aiming to be a sort of means of communication between the new community and its friends in the states the date of the first issue is november eighteen eighty eight and of the last december eighteen ninety one as by this time i take it the readers have become so much interested in the personality of mr duncan that they will prefer to hear as much as they possibly can from him personally it will perhaps not be amiss here to reproduce an article from his pen in the first number of this paper entitled a day at metlakatla both because it in itself is rich in interesting news from the new settlement at this early date and also because it gives a veritable pen picture of what was required of this wonderful man from day to day while he was superintending and assisting in building up a new home for his people as well as his unlimited capacity for all kinds of work the article reads as follows november thirteenth eighteen eighty eight the weather this morning like yesterday is fair bright and frosty such a delightful change from the dreary and soaking wet weather we have had for the last two months having twenty-two men employed i begin the duties of the day by going to look after them i found waterproof coats were doffed and everybody outside seemed brisk and busy before i had finished my inspection i was summoned to breakfast but i told the cook to ask dr bluet not to wait for me having finished my work outside i took a hasty meal then the school bell rang and quickly one hundred and thirty-two children all with happy faces took their places in the school we commence school as usual by singing a verse of the good old hymn guide me o thou great jehovah prayer followed and then the scripture lesson the subject this morning being the meeting of jacob and esau the children then marched to their classes seven in number the sexes being divided with the exception of the first class i have three native assistants and we go to work at what is called the three r's and soon the usual hum of school sets in we teach the children to read and write in english but i am sorry to say the lessons furnished in the primary reading books are generally very unsuitable for indian children having too much nonsense about cats owning tails and dogs being able to bark and so forth all such information appearing very ridiculous to the indian aspirant after learning when translated into his mother tongue this morning the reading lesson in one class was exceptionally good it was the fable of the dog and the shadow after reading the lesson the children were asked to write on their slates what they thought was the lesson the fable teaches us one boy wrote when people let fall the truth they find nothing we have no fire in our school and the building we are temporarily using is so draughty that if king alfred with his candle clock occupied it he would be obliged to use curtains to keep the flame steady i therefore gave the children ten minutes recess to warm themselves by a scamper on the beach the lively scene which ensued would take too long to describe i suppose this is the only school in alaska where there is no fire yet i doubt very much whether there is such another healthy community of children in any part of the territory as ours is time being up lessons recommenced at the end of the three school hours the children seem glad to get their freedom the boys rush to secure their wanted place for their favorite game of marbles and so fascinated are they with this game that they seem to forget they need any food before returning to school on several occasions i have caught them playing in the pouring rain and twice lately i saw them playing on the road by the light of a lantern i see that an indian boy is as proud of his bag of marbles as a white boy is a little pleasant excitement was caused in the village this morning by two men employed by our musicians setting to work to fell a huge and noble-looking pine the stir was due to the difficulty of the undertaking 
the tree had to be cut about twenty-four feet from the ground and made to fall in a certain direction to avoid crushing the houses near it the men performed their work admirably and were so elated with their success that they nailed a pole on top of the stump with four small american flags attached to it the twenty-four feet of trunk left standing is to form the base for a stand on which the brass band will be mounted to greet our friends or any government officials when they come to see us in the afternoon i went to our steam sawmill to talk over the work to be done with our native foreman the men have lately completed an order of over sixteen thousand cases from a salmon cannery about thirty miles off all the work of sawing planing and stenciling these cases was done by the natives and done so satisfactorily that the order given us for another year is nearly doubled i then stepped into a sash and furniture workshop lately erected by two native artisans on their own account they have managed to bring into their service a small stream to turn the wheel by which their lathe is worked the men were busy executing an order from a neighboring indian tribe for a grave fence i noticed too that they had finished a nice-looking bedstead of yellow cypress which i learn forms part of an order from portland oregon my business with them was to tender the work of making me some large windows and doors for the new school we are erecting if we can agree upon the terms i left them to think over the prices and let me know them to-night i next walked to the site on which we are erecting our permanent school and gave some directions to the workmen in the evening several of the men came to receive their wages and others to pay their accounts for lumber obtained at the mill after supper one of our people came to see me privately about a family quarrel which he wished me to help him to settle while however he was telling his story another man walked in to press his complaint against the man of a distant tribe a haida who with his party happened to be here for the purpose of trade and staying in the village guesthouse as it was supposed the accused man would be leaving our village early the next morning i concluded to settle his case first accordingly i sent for the native constable who holds a commission from the government and directed him to go and tell the stranger i wanted to see him and that he might bring his friends with him as the haida and tsimshian languages are totally unlike i also sent for one of our people who knows them both to act as interpreter in the meantime several persons dropped in to listen and as soon as the haida and his friends arrived we opened the case the affair was this the complainant and the accused had met while hunting bears on prince of wales island the former greeted the latter courteously but his civility was not reciprocated the haida both by looks and words and still more particularly by suspiciously manipulating his gun showed signs of anger the complainant stated that he had kept his temper otherwise he felt sure violence would have ensued in defence the accused said that the complainant not knowing the haida language had allowed his fears to be unnecessarily aroused that the angry words he used were not addressed to the complainant but to the haida in company with him and as for the way he carried his gun that was explained by the fact he was hunting bears as no act of violence had been committed or threatening language used it remained for me only to caution and instruct the accused man which i did very fully i was glad to find that my words were well received he thanked me and said he was glad to hear good words and know the law and on his return home he would not fail to tell his people what he had learned the complainant and the accused then shook hands and went away with the greater part of the audience among the few remaining were the man who came in first about the family quarrel and a haida not from the same village as the man i had just dismissed who had some trouble to tell me of the latter said he had chosen a young woman from the clinket people for a wife and both the young woman and her guardian had favored his suit the engagement being made he went over to her tribe and had already given a month's labor to her relations for their good will for some reason however of which he professed to be ignorant her guardian had suddenly annulled the agreement and ordered him to leave the village i promised to send a message to the persons concerned by the first canoe which leaves here and when i have ascertained the facts on the other side 
i shall know what to advise in the case there are i am sorry to say some old customs still rife among these tribes in regard to marriage which are constantly provoking trouble when questioned individually not an indian will venture to defend them and yet they retain their hold on the public mind after the haida had left i addressed the man who had patiently waited some hours for a private interview about his family affairs the remedy for his trouble was humility and kindness these i prescribed for him and he went away i then had two foremen to talk with about the morrow's work after they had left me i took a peep at the beautiful moonlit sky soon i heard the bugle sounding in the village the welcome go to bed and then came my quiet hour for reading end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf leaves from mr duncan's diary before proceeding with a short account of the history of the village in the way of industrial and other development i will invite the reader to partake of a little treat from mr duncan's diary from which i have already during the earlier phases of the history of the mission drawn quite liberally this diary was faithfully kept up by mr duncan from the day he left england until within a few years ago it is not to be understood however that he made entries in this diary from day to day but now and then as something out of the ordinary happened he chronicled the occurrence more in the nature of a complete sketch than by attempting to give its gradual development each day i am particularly inclined to reproduce these extracts from his diary because they will give the reader an idea of the celebration of christmas and new year's day among these people every year also because they contain brief mention of some of the last law cases with which mr duncan was burdened in a few years white settlements were started near by and he then cheerfully limited his magisterial duties to his own people although mr duncan ever since has been and still is a united states commissioner with all the powers and duties of a magistrate so peacefully inclined are these people and so little crime is committed by or among them at least when at home that for years this office of mr duncan's has been the merest sinecure in fact his only duty has consisted in making out his annual report to this effect number of cases tried none amount of fees and fines collected none amount of disbursements none i call the following entries from his diary with such parts omitted which i do not think of particular interest at the present time december eighteenth eighteen eighty eight rarely a day passes that i have not some grievances to settle but one brought before me to-day was of more than ordinary interest reminding me of my early days among the Timshians in british columbia a native named Inuetka from the village of lakshaila about thirty miles off came here a few days ago to lay a complaint against one skigan of the same village he was accompanied by a brother to act as his spokesman and his gloomy and morose looks indicated his trouble was of a very serious nature i then listened to a long and painful story which convinced me that the complainant and the accused were deadly rivals and that in order to prevent them from shedding each other's blood no time was to be lost in settling their quarrel i therefore at once wrote a letter to skigan to inform him that anuetka was at metlakatla waiting to meet him before me and that i would undertake to settle their differences as peacemaker if he would come here without delay but if he refused my invitation i should be obliged to send men with a warrant to arrest him i well knew that neither skigan nor any of his people could read the letter i sent but it served as a seal to the verbal message i gave to the bearer anuetka and his brother both doubted the efficacy of my plan assuring me that skigan would not come to metlakatla unless i sent a force to take him events have shown however that their forebodings were uncalled for today skigan arrived having travelled over thirty miles of dangerous sea in his canoe with his aged uncle and other members of his family tonight a large gathering of our people assembled to listen to the case 
skigon a bold and stern-looking man took his seat with a defiant stare at his accuser anuetka and the latter at once began to relate a series of attacks made upon his person and property i took notes skigon sat silent and stolid till his turn came to make his countercharges against anuetka finally it appeared that the offences each had committed against the other were pretty evenly balanced and each had while under the influence of liquor attempted to take the life of the other the case gave me ample scope and illustration for a serious address on the misery of a sinful and lawless life an opportunity for showing in contrast the blessings which the gospel of christ if embraced would ensure them after my address a solemn scene ensued both anuetka and skigon stood up and each placed his hand on the bible as a token of their sincere desire to forgive and forget the wrongs of the past this done they approached each other and shook hands which act evoked many expressions of joy from the audience thus a deadly feud was healed the mail steamer idaho which we have been expecting for the last twelve days arrived this morning bringing us some freight from portland as our supply of flour and groceries was almost exhausted and christmas was very near the arrival of the steamer caused great rejoicing in the village and especially among the children her delay we were sorry to learn was due to some crippling injuries she had sustained in a gale of wind on her last downward trip the steamer being bound for sitka the seat of government for alaska we had i regret to say five passengers for her two white men being prisoners and three natives acting as guards the two men were arrested on their way north by canoe over two weeks ago for smuggling intoxicating liquors and i had to commit them for trial at sitka the greater portion some two hundred and forty gallons of their liquor fell into our hands and remains in our custody till we receive orders from sitka what to do with it sunday december twenty third eighteen eighty eight our unusually large attendance at church during the winter season was augmented to-day by the addition of some sixty or seventy strangers who arrived here yesterday to spend christmas with us though they came without being invited they were heartily welcomed and hospitably received by our people our guests are from four native villages and of two distinct languages both being very different to the language of the metlakatlans monday january seventh eighteen eighty nine christmas and new year is always a joyous season with the people of metlakatla and the last one has proved to be no exception to the rule though still living in temporary shanties built among stumps and huge trees both standing and fallen yet the people are healthy and happy some few days before christmas the usual avocations of the natives are suspended smiling faces greet you everywhere and the village storekeepers are overwhelmed with business the church elders hold meetings for the purpose of restoring the fallen and reconciling to each other persons who have quarrelled on christmas eve there is a noticeable stillness outside but the houses are illuminated the waits are rehearsing their christmas carols in the schoolroom and i have deputations from the officials of the village council elders constables brass band and fire brigade to interrogate me about the proceedings of tomorrow late at night the two men one being a born artist who have designed and secretly prepared some christmas decorations are busy arranging them in our temporary church during the first hours of christmas morning the voices of thirty of our young men are heard outside singing hymns of praise some in their own tongue and some in english on christmas morning at eleven o'clock our church was crowded for divine service the decorations were admirable both in design and execution the principal figure was an angel with outstretched wings holding in each hand an olive branch and supporting most gracefully by both hands a flying scroll some thirty feet long on which was written on earth peace good will to men nations shall learn war no more the service was commenced by chanting our christmas song in tsimshian and preceding the address the choir sang the anthem god is the refuge of his people the collection amounted to one hundred thirty dollars eight cents the largest sum ever contributed by our people on one occasion the money will be passed to the building fund for the proposed new church 
the afternoon was occupied with the children happy family indeed one hundred ninety of whom received toys while but five were sent empty away for misconduct the last night in the year was dark and stormy nevertheless the attendance at our midnight meeting was very large the order of service was as follows him and Simpson on the departure of another year prayer address on peter's bitter repentance silent prayer from eleven fifty five to twelve o five singing the prodigal's resolve and a hymn on the opening year address on st paul's cry for guidance anthem safely through another year the service being closed with prayer by two of the elders the first of january was a memorable day at metlakatla in the morning all the men assembled to witness the admittance of fifteen new members to our male community ten of whom were from four native villages near by and five were Timsians. the newcomers were placed in the centre of the building and after my address each approached the table and placed his left hand on the bible and raised his right in token of the sincerity of his act he then subscribed his name to be a faithful member of our community obedient to the law and loyal to the government of the united states in the evening all the men again assembled this time for tea talk and music the strangers were invited and their table was placed in the centre of the building our feast consisted of biscuits tea apples and raisins the brass band played at intervals and sixteen stirring speeches were made after my address we sang the doxology and the meeting closed before leaving the council and elders tendered their badges of office as the new elections for these offices will take place this week january eighteen eighteen eighty nine sad news a canoe manned by natives arrived from tongas late last night bringing the corpse of a murdered man and the murderer both white men this morning i held an inquest and took the depositions of witnesses the six jurors were metlakatlans and on their verdict i committed the accused for trial he will leave here under native guard in a few days intoxicating liquor procured as usual at port simpson from the store of the hudson's bay company was at the bottom of this sad tragedy end of chapter thirty seven